So hi everyone, it's great to be here on this uh, on this podcast talking to you. Um, I just finished a book called uh, Reality Plus. It's a philosophical study of issues about reality, especially virtual reality. I think I am a philosopher myself. In the past, I've worked a lot on issues about consciousness. Uh, how are we conscious? How does the brain give you subjective experience? This book is uh, very much, though, on the side, not about the mind, but about the external world. And it's about the relationship between technology and philosophy, because we now have technology for, um, for building new realities. In the past, we had just one reality, physical reality. Now we can build many new artificial realities, virtual realities. So this is philosophically fascinating. What are these virtual realities? Are they real? Can we live a reasonable life in them? Other questions. Could it be that we are ourselves right now in a virtual reality? This is the so-called simulation hypothesis. So in the book, I try to ask these questions about the nature of reality and the nature of virtual reality. My central thesis is that virtual reality is a genuine reality. It's very often thought that virtual realities are fake or fictional or second class realities. My view is that is wrong. Virtual reality in principle can be as real as physical reality. In principle, we can lead a meaningful life in a virtual reality. And if our world is already a virtual reality, I think it's possible our world is a simulation. Our world is a virtual reality. If that's right, it doesn't mean that our life is an illusion or a hallucination, or that nothing is real. If we're in a virtual reality already, our life still has meaning and the world is still real. So I don't think the idea that the universe is a simulation is something we should fear. If it's true, it's just one more way for our reality to be. Yeah, these ideas of virtual realities they go a long way back in the history of philosophy and the history of science. I mean, the computer itself was only invented in the, uh, the 20th century. So the idea of virtual reality is a new one, but it builds on so many old ideas in the history, in the historical tradition. I mean, is the world real? Is it just a fantasy? Is it just an illusion? In ancient Chinese philosophy, we find the philosopher Guangzhou asking, am I dreaming now or am I awake? Am I now? He has a dream that he's a butterfly and he wakes up and says, now, am I Guangzhou who just dreamed he was a butterfly or am I a butterfly dreaming that he's Guangzhou? That's a way of asking the question, how do I know now if this is a dream? Plato told the story uh, that maybe we're like prisoners shackled in a cave, staring at shadows on the cave wall. And then we ask, the, is this the real world or is this just the world of shadows? In ancient Hindu philosophy, Vishnu and others expressed the view that everything is an illusion. It's Maya. It's an illusion. Is this the real world? Or is it just illusion? These days, we ask that question by asking, is this the real world or is it just a simulation? Is it just virtual reality? So really, it's a version of the same question. Now we have computers, we have technology. It enables us to ask some of these questions about reality in a more precise way. But exactly the same issues arise. Very similar issues at least arise with dreams, with shadows, with ancient 
metaphysical theories. And I think just as my view is we can never be sure we're not in a simulation, we probably can also not be sure that this is not a dream. There's no way to rule out the hypothesis that I'm dreaming right now, but I'd say even if this is a dream right now, it still has the status of some kind of reality. All of these ideas are very central in literature, in fiction, especially in science fiction. I mean, the idea of the world as a simulation is beautifully encapsulated in the Matrix movies. In fact, now to express this idea to someone, we just ask the question, how do you know you're not in the Matrix right now? And you know, the first Matrix movie especially is a wonderful reflection on this question. The ideas in science fiction go back further, of course. I think uh, the novel Simulacron 4, or was it Simulacron 3, in 1963, uh, was one of the first explorations of these ideas. The science fiction writer Stanislav Lem wrote many classic stories about alternative realities. And in my book, I try wherever I can to illustrate these ideas with scenarios from science fiction. Sometimes it's Star Trek. Uh, the question is Data, the android, is he conscious or not? He goes on trial. So we can see whether he's conscious. Sometimes it's um, the Wachowskis, uh, the Matrix. Are we in the Matrix? Sometimes it's oh, Greg Egan on Permutation City, wonderful science fiction, wonderful science fiction author. Sometimes it's uh, Black Mirror, the TV series, which illustrates so many of these ideas. So I find that science fiction provides a rich tapestry of thought experiments. You know, in science, thought experiments are important. In philosophy, they're even more important. We present a scenario and we think about it. Here we are in the matrix. What does it mean? Is it real? I wrote this book so that it's both very serious work of philosophy. It's going to be very serious work putting forward some original ideas and arguments. But also I want it to be a book that anybody can read, that it's full of uh, accessible examples, science fiction, pop culture. There are even illustrations, 50 or 60 illustrations throughout the book, which I, I love the, the illustrations. So I want it to be both, a book for anyone, but also a book for my academic colleagues. I want them to take it seriously. And there they, the book is, it's still new, two months, two months old and so on. But as far as I can tell, my colleagues in philosophy and in science are reading about it and commenting. But at the same time, it's a book that, hey, my family can read or my, uh, or my friends. So for me, it's been very important to try to do some serious academic work in a format that anybody can understand. And for me, it's really the first time doing this. I wrote some other books, but they were more academic books intended more specifically for the academic audience. But now, at the beginning, I think, at the beginning of your career, it can be dangerous to write something that's too popular or too much fun because people might think you're not serious. By now, I don't know, I'm in my 50s. I've done a lot of work. But people have already decided if I'm serious. Um, hopefully, some people. Hopefully, I have some credibility with some people, and that way, I, you get to explore this idea in this totally different tone of voice, with examples and illustrations and science fiction. And for me, this has been this has been a wonderful gift because it's enabled me to uh, to uh, talk about these issues with so many more people than I was talking with before. Se você gostou desse vídeo, dê um like, compartilhe. Aproveite para assinar o canal e ative as notificações.